Do you know someone whose ability to independently care for themselves is diminishing? What are the options for older people who can no longer live on their own? Do you have preconceived notions about long-term care? Hello, my name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, and welcome to Your Money, Your Life. In this segment, my guest is Anthony Cirillo, an aging expert and passionate advocate for seniors. Anthony is the author of Who Moved My Dentures, a book debunking the myths about nursing homes. In addition, Anthony's blog, also called Who Moved My Dentures, is listed as one of the top boomer blogs by all top and feeds to other health sites, including Dr. Oz's ShareCare. But that's not all. Did you know that Anthony is also a gifted singer and performer? Anthony, welcome to Your Money, Your Life. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks, Ramsey. It's a pleasure to be here. Anthony, you have a very diverse background, and you arrived at your mission in a very unusual way. Can you tell our viewers how you became involved in elder issues, and what are your goals? In other words, what are you trying to achieve? Sure. So I have to take you back to my days in Philadelphia. I now live outside of Charlotte. And in the, in the Philadelphia era, I was kind of down two different tracks. So I was a um, healthcare professional, a hospital marketing guy uh, by day, and uh, helping hospitals to uh, you know, attract patients and, and, uh, into their beds and into their services. And uh, by night, I was also a um, professional musician and uh, more than just a um, hobby, semi-professional, been to Nashville to record and have won some songwriting awards. And so always had this music and this healthcare profession kind of on parallel tracks. And one day, I kind of got tired of being in, in bands. It, it's almost like having another family and all the politics associated with, uh, with all of the you know, band members. And, uh, and I, I got out for a while. And I had a guy who was working for me in, in, in the hospital who was a professional juggler, right? And uh, he said, you should go and check out some of these places. They could probably need your talents. And I walked into a nursing home one day and I started to sing for the elders there. And, you know, quite selfishly, the first time it became more about making some side money. And then what happened over time, when I was starting to do 100 performances a year, literally in Philadelphia, uh, I began to realize how fulfilling it was and, and what a difference I was making. I noticed in checking your website that you have a touching story of how your mission with elders was solidified. Could you share that story with us, please? Sure. It's called the story of Esther. And uh, Esther was a um, resident in an assisted living facility in Hickory, North Carolina. So uh, after I moved down here about 12 years ago, started singing down here uh, on the side. And I call her my designated heckler. So you might imagine over time we became really good friends because I'm the type of guy uh, who would go right back at her in a fun way. And um, a few years back, I had to go sing there and the uh, activity director asked me if I would go visit Esther in the hospital uh, after my performance. And I really didn't think much of it. Unbeknownst to me, Esther had actually had a, a, a you know, a, a heart attack, an episode of, a, you know, a week or so before and had actually died and was revived. And so she was in the coronary care unit. And uh, I said, what the heck does she want to see me for? And so when I got there, uh, her daughter was there, and I was with the activity director, and, and Esther started flirting with me, and her daughter was just all embarrassed and stuff. And Esther basically wanted me to sing to her. She, she summoned me to sing, and she wanted a particular song, and it was, it was called Because He Lives. It's a beautiful song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Beautiful song. One problem, I didn't know it. I have a recording studio in my house, and I... I learned the song, I recorded a CD for her, and I sent it to her. By then, she was back in the assisted living facility, and it was a great hit with her. Uh, unfortunately, just a few weeks later, she was in hospice, and then she passed. I went to Esther's funeral, and uh, when I walked in, the daughter came over to me, and, and she started crying. And, uh, you know, you can imagine, as I was walking toward her, I'm thinking, what's, you know, what's going on? And what she told me was that... Um, essentially on Esther's last day of life, they played my CD uh, with one, one song, one three and a half minute song, Because He Lives, over and over again. 
and uh, to the point where the daughter actually knelt down next to her mother and started singing with me. And, uh, and essentially, Esther died that day listening to my voice. And uh, I don't know how much more powerful it can get than that when you think that maybe you helped somebody transition from one life to another and helped uh, the family caregiver in some way uh, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, have a special moment at the end of their life. But when people ask me, why do you keep doing all this? And I basically tell that story and say, how can you not keep on doing it? You know, Anthony, helping somebody who's on their deathbed like that to transition, as you put it, that, that is really amazing. And it's, I'm sure, a memory that you're never going to forget because it's the type of thing that doesn't happen very often. Um, so, you know, I, I really, I really think it's wonderful that you were able to do that, that you were able to help her, uh, and obviously you're also helping other people as well. You know, I want to get to your book for a second, and I want you to know that when I first heard that you wrote a book called Who Moved My Dentures, I had to chuckle. I said, you know, I mean, we hear about elderly people and dentures, but I never heard a book called that. Can you, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write this book? And, and what's up with the title? Why did you pick that title? <laughs> well, yeah, all right. So after I started, it's all a natural progression, actually, Ramsey. And, and when I started uh, singing in the nursing homes, I was starting to meet a lot of special people. And it got to the point where I couldn't ignore their stories anymore. And being a writer in my profession as a, a marketing guy, uh, you know, I, I wanted to start capturing some of their stories. And so what I wrote was a book of really human interest stories that in turn uh, impart lessons about aging, but are really primarily about in human interest stories about wonderful people. Now, now here's the thing about book titles, and, and I'm sure those in your audience could relate to this. You know, people come up with catchy book titles because, you know, that's the first thing that attracts people to the book is the title. And so, the, you know, when I was thinking about this, I kind of just blurted out who moved my dentures one day and we went with it. I then rationalized it after the fact. And the way I rationalized it was this way. That cheese book was really about resiliency in the workplace, right? And so who moved my cheese was about that. Well, who moved my dentures is not much different. It's about resiliency and adaptability in your life situation. In this case, elders who at some point or another how to make a decision. And that decision was, do I need extra help and care? And, and should I consider the services of an assisted living or nursing home? Now, I know most of us, I'm a baby boomer, and uh, you know I'm going to fight tooth and nail to stay in this house that I'm in here and uh, do whatever I can, whether it's the grab bars or the technology that I need to stay in my home. But you have to really think about putting yourself in their place and think about what it takes to be able to to make that transition, uh, it's got to be incredibly hard, and yet, uh, and they made it. And so, really, the the who moved my dentures were not different, not much of a different premise than the cheese. You know, to be honest with you, Anthony, I don't know anyone, whether a friend, an acquaintance, or a client, who even wants to talk about a nursing home. I don't know anyone who wants anything to do with a nursing home. And I'm going to now segue into your book and the myths with regard to uh, long-term care facilities or nursing homes. Would you be willing to discuss with me some of those myths and so we can explore them and, and try to set them aside? Sure. And, you know, it's, it's not a perfect uh, science here in terms of what I cover. But let me preface it, first of all, with saying that I have learned so much from elders. And, you know, I go into a lot of nursing and assisted living and I see people who got there not because age caught up with them, but because they didn't keep up with themselves. And there's a lot that we can do beforehand in our lives in, in terms of our physical health and our financial and emotional health that can hopefully stem the tide of ever needing to go into assisted living and, or nursing home care. On the other hand, I also see you know, people who got there through whatever circumstance they needed to be there who basically can teach us some incredible lessons about how to live our life because the people I've met, like Esther, are not just surviving, they're thriving in some of these places. And a lot of it is because of who they were beforehand. So, for example, there's a woman in my book named Jean. 
And uh, Gene went into what they call a continuing care retirement community. Now they tend to be a little more upscale, a little more opulent. And of course they have a price tag that, that reflects that. But when Jean went in there, she thought she was in some kind of hotel in New York. And she looked at the whole experience, not as a burden, but as an opportunity. And here was a woman who was a mild-mannered housewife who basically blossomed, blossomed in the skilled nursing facility of a continuing care retirement community. She would go to all the programs, including mine. She would sing along. She was outspoken. She would say what was on her mind. And she didn't do this when she was, uh, when she was a, quote, a mild-mannered housewife. And, you know, it really goes to the point that, you know, there is going to be a segment of the population that needs these places, and there's going to be good places and there's going to be bad places. But also your mindset going into them is going to determine how you thrive or not. And, and you really have to start looking at it if you need these places, not as a place to die, but as a place to live the next chapter in your life. So, you know, that's kind of that's one myth that I hope to bust that nursing homes or assisted living are not places you go to die, but places you go to live another chapter in your life. Let's face it, people are living longer and uh, even the average age in assisted living is in their 80s now. And uh, I go to places where, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, signs on the door of, who, you know, what residents turning 106 this month. So uh, you might be there a while, you know. So, um, so that's one. Um, obviously, a longstanding, uh, you know, uh, perception of these, uh, of these facilities are that they're depressing and they're unclean, and yet they're very, particularly in nursing homes, they're very highly regulated. And so they really have to keep up to certain standards to control uh, the spread of infections and things like that. So, you know, I think that uh, that's something that uh, people should keep in mind. You know, the old uh, smell of urine in nursing homes is a, the big perception. I think a lot has changed in that regard. And, you know, the nursing homes and assisted living are moving toward what we call more person-centeredness, person-centered care, really recognizing the person as an individual and understanding what their needs are and trying to honor them, whether it's, you know, not having set meal times or even where you have your meal. So, you know, I think people need to understand that. Believe me, I'm not a pro-nursing or assisted living guy. Like I said, I'm a baby boomer who wants to age in place as well. But yet, I think people need to, if you go in with a little less fear, I think, and a little more education, you have a better chance of picking the right places and, uh, and uh, surviving the experience. Well, let me follow up on that, Anthony. You talked about picking the right place uh, versus the wrong place. How do people go about picking the right place? What questions should they be asking in order to make sure that they, to quote you, have the proper experiences? So first of all, uh, just the things you could do just sitting at your computer as I am here. Uh, you know, you can go onto sites like Nursing Home Compare. They have something called the five-star quality rating system. And they rate nursing homes on different parameters from, you know, staffing to quality. And so you can at least get a baseline, particularly if you already have the geography narrowed down to where you want someone to be. You can narrow it, you know, you can compare facilities. And so that at least gives you an idea of, you know, I think, the, you know, these three sound okay to start with. But then there's also a myriad of other resources out there, and they range from, you know, U.S. News and World Report to, uh, you know, uh, consumer uh, affairs magazines and, uh, and and other things like that. Consumer Reports is the one I couldn't get out of my tongue there. Uh, and so you could start doing some homework that way. Uh, you could also talk to uh, discharge planners in hospitals. Now, if you're already in the middle of the crisis, the discharge planner isn't going to be much help because they really can't recommend. But if you can prepare beforehand uh, and talk to people, they may have a better idea of, of you know what you're looking for and what they could be able to tell you. Pastoral care people as well, people in the community. You want to utilize your social networks as well online, but there's so many online resources as well that you can avail yourself of. Uh, you want to look at the accreditation of the facility, uh, you know, and... Uh, I see, um, you know, some facilities are also accredited by the same organization that accredits hospitals. It's called the Joint Commission. Uh, I think that, you know, um, organizations that are accredited by the Joint Commission maybe have a little bit better quality standards. Um, you may want to talk to uh, the uh, long-term care agencies in your county. Uh, there are uh, positions called long-term care ombudsman, 
and uh, they are people who go in to uh, nursing homes and advocate for the rights of residents. So there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, resources out there that you can avail yourself of. Eventually, though, you're going to want to go to a place and, and probably take a tour. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to start picking up on some of the cultural cues in an organization. So one place we went in, we literally sat for 15 minutes before anybody come out and even tried to help us. And then all they did was basically shove some brochures in our face. And that was the extent of our visit. And another place we went to, uh, which I already had a feeling based on some of the things I had read and heard that this might be the one, they were more than accommodating. They were out of their seats as soon as we walked in. We had a tour of the place. And you could pick up some cues just by touring a place uh, in terms of, you know, the amount of staff that they have, whether management is actively involved and walking the floors and interacting with residents and staff. You might want to bring a nurse into a place with you to ask the clinical questions. You might want to check on the staffing levels. You know, I even have tips and hints in, on my blogs and my book about looking at the, uh, the ownership of some of these places because some of them are, you know, let's face it, there are for-profit nursing homes and they're not-for-profit nursing homes. And knowing the ownership type might give you a hint about where their motivations lie. Now, that's a generalization, but there have been actual studies that show that for-profit nursing homes tend to have less staffing ratio, you know, nurse to patient staffing, and therefore lower quality. So, you know, a question that you may not think of asking right off the bat is something you might uh, want to look at. You know, you want to look at the residents. Do they look happy? Are they clean? And, uh, you know, are they wearing footwear? Are the men shaved? I mean, I have probably a uh, hundred different tips that we can go into that, uh, that you want to look at. But, you know, you have to also when you leave it all, kind of go with your gut, because I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a feeling that you have. You know, Anthony, a critical issue for families when it comes to looking at nursing homes is cost. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, several resources that are available. By the way, I thought the presentation you just made was extremely helpful. But does cost in any way, is cost rather in any way an indicator of the quality of a nursing home and what one can expect to, to receive? There, there is a perception um, of if a place looks good, like, you know, for example, and it's no secret, Frontline did a special on uh, life and death and assisted living. And it, it looked at one of the, the largest providers of assisted living in the country. And, you know, the, the thing with assisted living has been that when you walk in, uh, you know, the wallpaper and the chandeliers make you think that, uh, and of course, there's a value to that and a price tag that goes with it. But if you actually explore the care for some of these places, they could maybe perhaps have as many incidents as places that are not quite as fancy, but maybe have a better staffing ratio. So, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily cost. Costs are an issue, though, and, uh, you know, I don't know how much you want to explore that, but people do need to understand because people really don't understand. Even people in, in, my, in my hospital profession don't understand how long-term care is, is paid for. You know, so, for example, if, if you're hospitalized, and uh, right now there's still a three-day rule to pay, have to be hospitalized three days, you know, in a hospital before Medicare will pick up a certain amount of your care in a nursing home, but that's really one of the few situations where Medicare actually kicks in and really only pays full freight for 20 days. Uh, but for the most part, and it's a horrible, horrible way to age in this country, the most part you're paying out of pocket until your funds are exhausted and then maybe you qualify for Medicaid unless, unless you either are quite wealthy and have saved money to be able to pay for this kind of care for a m number of years. I think, you know, nursing home costs right now are eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. Um, assisted living, anywhere from, you know, $3,600 a month to five or $6,000 a month. Uh, so, uh, you know, unless you're quite wealthy, that's, that's an option. Very few people are embracing long-term care insurance. You know, uh, when it comes to paying for long-term care in a nursing home, you're looking at long-term care insurance, 
uh, you're looking at for a short period of time, Medicare, so long as you go in the hospital for three days, and then it's a 20 to a maximum of 100-day period per year. And then you're looking at Medicaid, which is a form of welfare. And, of course, there's planning that has to be done in order to qualify for Medicaid, or you have to be poor, uh, one or the other. Right. Uh, so, and that's it. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that, that there are other sources that will pay for their long-term care in a nursing home like health insurance. Absolutely not. That's just not going to happen. A lot of people don't have long-term care insurance, so that for a lot of people is off the table. So there, a lot of people actually fall into the self-pay category. And it, as you've pointed out, it's very, very expensive. From everything that I'm hearing, you're in favor of planning and uh, planning ahead rather and making sure that you have your, your ducks in place, so to speak, before an issue like this turns into a crisis. Am I hearing that correctly? A absolutely. And I actually call my platform Educated Aging and, and my blog, I've actually renamed the Who Moved My Dentures blog to Educated Aging and uh, it's educatedaging.com. And basically my premise is this, that you need to plan for your aging issues sooner in life in three areas, f uh, physical health, financial health, and emotional health. And, uh, you know, the physical health, we're learning more and more. Essentially, how people take care of themselves earlier in life is going to affect how they age. We're a country that, um, you know, we're just obsessed with chronic conditions and chronic disease and obesity. And so much of this is within the realm of people to prevent themselves. And if people would just, you know, start looking at their physical health issues earlier in life, I think that a lot of people would avoid having to go into these places to begin with. Because like I said, there's a lot of people that I see in these places who got there not because age caught up, but because they didn't keep up. And, you know, some people ask, well, you know, who, who's going to listen to this message, you know, especially younger people? Well, there's kind of a few things emerging. First of all, you know, I'm a boomer, but our ne the next generation down, the Gen Xers, are actually becoming the new sandwich generation. They're the ones who are caring for parents who are aging and young, and they're still raising their children. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, the boomer parents are the World War II generation. And, you know, knock on wood, my in-laws and my mom are still around. My mom will be 93 next birthday. But this is a, this is a generation that's passing on. And so, it, it, you know, people who are younger need to start thinking about these things. And they have a prime opportunity now to prepare not only for themselves, but help their you know, somewhat younger parents prepare as well. I've read uh, some reports recently where um, risky behavior in your youth, in your 20s, uh, actually can actually affect uh, whether or not you might get early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. And, you know, that's another thing that people don't talk about a whole lot. You know, there are people in their 40s and 50s who are uh, have Alzheimer's and dementia. We're just starting to see some of this you know, from the national football, right? And helmets and concussions and some of the things that are going on there. So physical health, uh, the financial health, I don't have to dwell on it a, a whole lot because, you know, it is it is what it is. And not everybody has the, you know, frankly, the, the uh, resources uh, to be able to do this. They, they, just, they just don't. And so it's hard. I mean, people are just about saving for retirement, let alone saving for uh, long-term care needs. Um, the third platform is emotional health. And what do I mean by that? And uh, what I mean by that is that there are people in nursing homes who are surviving and there are people who are thriving. And a lot of it has to do with who they were before they became, uh, you know, had to go into some of these places. And so they have certain characteristics and we can learn a lot from them. And, uh, you know, one of the programs I give, uh, one of the keynotes I give is a program called The Meaning of Life. I'm so presumptuous about that. But I talk about seven or eight different points that I've learned from elders who I consider are having a quality life in places we most associate with death. My platform is, is what I call educated aging that we need to prepare sooner in life to avoid a crisis later in life. Anthony, I'd like to shift over to the holidays. Now, holidays are times of family rituals. And families oftentimes will get together for what everyone hopes will be a happy time. Uh, I've heard it say that this is an ideal time for family meeting about issues surrounding elder care, finances, and estate planning. But as we all know, in many cases, siblings are often rivals and they aren't always agreeable. They aren't always able to come, come to the same conclusion. In your opinion, 
Anthony, what can be done to assure that these family meetings are successful and result in a consensus? Now, obviously, I'm not a, a psychologist or a, a family mediator, uh, so I can only kind of go by my own, what I see and what I observe and what I've experienced in my own life. This time of year is particularly a good time. It does. It sounds totally counterintuitive, but it's a great time when families together to talk about some of these issues because first of all for a lot of families they might have not seen the elder loved one for quite some time and when they go and visit they may start observing some things where it calls for maybe an extra needed level of care that they, they probably weren't aware of the year before uh, likewise if an elder one comes over and visits so I think when you have uh, people there uh, is a great time to have the discussion but I think you really need to respect the elder and respect their intelligence and their ability to still make decisions and let them articulate what it is that they want. Anthony, for me, the key is making sure that the elder loved one is safe, is healthy, that's going to be able to meet their goals. That's, that's, that's the bottom line for me. Uh, I, you know, I agree with you. You've got to let them talk. You've got to listen to what they have to say. Um, it's actually a lose-lose proposition to try to do otherwise. Um, so. You know, it's, it's just best to listen to what the older adult has to say and then help them. Anyway, I think that's a good place for us to stop. As Americans live increasingly longer lives, for many the day will come when they'll have to live with age-related disability and even require long-term care. As the advances in medical technology extend the lives of people with age-related disabilities and illnesses, many will need careful monitoring that is beyond the abilities of most family caregivers or for that matter part-time aides. To understand the various elder care options, educate yourself about such things as home care, congregate housing, assisted living, nursing home care, and hospice care. Remember that the more information you have, the more comfortable you and your loved ones will be with your decision. A good place to start is the EducatedAging.com website where Mr. Cirillo posts educational and informative articles. And don't forget to read Anthony Cirillo's book, Who Moved My Dentures, which contains both inspirational human interest stories and important practical advice on how to choose long-term care facilities. In closing, I'd like to thank my guest, Anthony Cirillo, accomplished entertainer and aging expert who combines his talents to actively promote the quality of life and the dignity of older adults. Anthony, thank you for participating on Your Money, Your Life. Thanks, Ramsey. It was a pleasure. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, building your trust.